Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another Wine Spectator Two Bottle Tasting Series. Um, as you know, usual, I've got my great wingman with me, Travis Hinkle, Advanced Psalm Beverage Director for the Post Oak Grand Award winning Wineless Program here in Houston, Texas. Travis, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Keith. Super excited to be here to talk about some Carneros. Yeah, it's this kind of fun little, uh, we've got Boucher and Winery, which is kind of one of those like old kind of classic wineries in Napa that's been there for a really long time, but in the last probably 15, 20 years has really gone through a renovation and kind of exciting. It's almost like this hidden gem that has got this, you know, infusion of new ownership turned into kind of this thing that, you know, for many years, I think Behringer had it back in the day and really did nothing with it. So I'm super excited to try these wines and carneros for me is this crazy kind of you know it's napa it's sonoma is it both i don't know so you know what's your kind of experience you've had with carneros as a region well Car carneros is kind of one of those exciting um i think of it almost as an outlier uh, outlier in terms of the napa valley so if you're driving up from san francisco you cross over the over the bridge and carneros is going to be the first sort of sub area of the napa valley that you'll drive through and it's really special because, you know, the San Pablo Bay that sits at the south side of the valley kind of acts as the, uh, I don't know, the air conditioning unit for the entire valley. And because Carneros is right in the mouth of those uh, cool uh, winds and fog coming in from the San Pablo Bay, it's an area where great varieties like Chardonnay, but then also Pinot Noir can really shine. Where in other parts of the valley, we're usually thinking about those grapes suited to warmer varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, but Pinot Noir, again, does really, really well in this area that's informed by those cool coastal weathers. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting because for me, there's certain wine regions where you can kind of go, like, if you can see the water, that's usually like the best vineyards. And I think of like Bordeaux. And what's interesting here is these are some of the vineyards that are literally like right on the bay, um, but it's almost the reverse thing where it's actually the cooler spots. So that to me is one of those things that's just it's really hard to understand about Napa unless you're there because you can be down there in Carneros and then drive 30 minutes up to Calistoga and easily sometimes see like a 30 to 40 degree temperature swing like it's crazy you can be freezing and just dying it's like wet cold gray super chilly foggy winds are almost always blowing down in Carneros and you get up into Calistoga and it can be close to 100 degrees so it's just fascinating that you can be so close, but have such a dynamically different um, growing conditions. And I have to think as the climate is shifting and changing, you know, this is an area where, you know, a lot of it was actually dairy land and people kind of thought it was too cold for grapes. And more and more you're seeing acreage getting bought out there and planted to grapes. So it'll be kind of interesting to see like, you know, does Carneros kind of get this you know, it was the side thing, kind of partial Napa, partial Sonoma. But now is it going to be like the rock star for Pinot and Chard? Who knows? I mean, what do you think, Travis? Yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about this before on the show before, where those cool climates are really so important for uh, being able to preserve the natural acidity in the wine. So here, when we're talking about a really sunny region, you're getting all of that abundant sunshine that you want for these wonderful kind of new world style wines. But then again, that cool weather comes in and allow those, uh, allows those grapes to maintain their, uh, their raciness and their acidity, which for me makes them mouthwatering, a little bit more elegant, and just provides some components that balance out that rich fruit characteristic. It'll be fun. Um, we've got uh, Chris Kajani, the winemaker for Boucher, coming up, and I'd love to like hear her take on it because I know she's been working in Carneros for a while now because she was at Saintsbury before Boucher and you know probably knows the area better than most, but you know, I remember a few, you know, 30 years ago when there were some people like, oh, we're going to cut Cabernet there, Merlot there. And there's a few pockets of Merlot that still do OK, but it is definitely kind of like the Chardonnay Pinot sweet spot for Napa. Um, Sonoma, you can make an argument, you know, because there's Sonoma Coast and some great Appalachians regions there where Pinot and Chard do well. But it's kind of this fun little area that, you know, I'm excited to try the wines and getting a little bit thirsty. So shall we go to the Chard? So we're tasting the uh, the Estate Chardonnay 2017 vintage. And right away, this is what I love about Carneros, because you are getting those kind of ripe tropical notes that you expect from a Napa Valley Chardonnay. But already, uh, it's got these really beautiful secondary notes. So for me, that's almost like uh, like popcorn, like almond, a little bit of, uh, of mineral character coming through on the nose, like wet stones. 
And then just a little bit of toastiness and vanilla coming from what I assume is just a little bit of French oak being used to season these wines. Yeah, and then you get on the palate and it's just got this like beautiful kind of Meyer lemon, preserved lemon, kind of honey note even kind of coming through. Um, and what was really kind of exciting and kind of doing the research on Bouchain is the owners, Garrett and Tatiana Copeland, um, were huge fans of Burgundy. And what I really love is other times you hear people talk the talk, but it was great that they actually walked the walk and bought land where Chardonnay and Pinot would do great. And to me, when I try this, it has almost kind of like that Chassagne Montrachet kind of richness, but elegance going on. And it's not as buttery, oaky, tropical as, say, some of the other California Chardonnays that I've had. So I love that they love Burgundy. Let's try to find a place to do Burgundy. And I'd be very curious to hear what Chris is doing, like in the winery to kind of keep that going or not going. But, you know, this is something that you know, I would love to like put in a blind tasting for you or some of the other Psalms on property just to see what you guys would end up calling because there is actually a little bit of minerality showing through on the finish. Be tricky. And, you know, this may sound so, uh, strange to some viewers, but sometimes I think about wine on the palate almost like shapes. And for me, this wine has almost a re uh, reverse tier shape where it kind of starts off broad and you're getting those, again, ripe fruit flavors, but then very quickly it tapers down in your mouth. And so you're left with this sort of uh, very precise mouthwatering acidity, which again, makes it finish dry. It's not one of these sort of cloying uh, uh, California Chardonnays that you sometimes encounter. Yeah, like, and this with food would be absolutely delicious. And like, I'd be like so happy with like a roast chicken with a squeeze of lemon on it. It'd be so good. And it's funny that I definitely, when I taste as well too, kind of do that, you know, my term for it was more like 3D mapping of the wine and like i kind of like to think what it is in the palate and this definitely has you know kind of a palate fill you don't see that often coming out of napa so pretty cool let's try the pinot that way you get that beautiful lift of aromas that are just uh you know indicative to the variety i think this is gorgeous and kind of straddles red and black fruit components i'm getting some tart red cherries but then also almost like the black raspberry and black plum as well. Yeah, but the other part that for me is, and it just speaks to this area, is I get this like crazy cola nut. And it's like this cola nut, sarsaparilla, kind of dark herbal thing. And just a quick side note, 2020 um, has been a rough year. And I just want to give a shout out to one, another, uh, another thing that we have lost. Uh, Tab, you had a good run. And um, I'm sorry that we've lost Tab, um, but being here in Houston <laughs> in Texas, Mr. Pib, live on. Um, but anyways, I can bring it on because it, it has that kind of like Mr. Pib, Tab, cherry cola kind of cool sweetness, but also herbal thing going on. That to me is Pinot. And then underneath that, there's even kind of like a dried floral thing, which is pretty. Rose petal, uh, potpourri, that sort of thing. And for me, Pinot Noir almost always has this really enticing allspice character. And that spiciness we sometimes think comes from oak, but I actually think in the terms of this subtle allspice, that's just something that's classic uh, for me, varietally for Pinot Noir. Yeah, I wanna, and I'd be curious to see if Chris says if maybe there's a little bit of whole cluster, some stems in there. And you may say like that allspice, for me, it's almost, it makes me think a little bit of like Peking duck, which is always a happy thing, thinking of Peking duck. Again, like we were talking with the Chardonnay, it's got abundant fruit. You know, you know it's from California, but it really finishes dry uh, and with lots of savory aspects to it that for me make it a little bit more exciting at the table than some examples of California Pinot Noir that you can sometimes encounter. Yeah, well, and then too, it, it's, you know, we may hit a lot on when we talk about like the acidity or the crispness of the wine, but to me, it's what gives it life. And there's an energy to this. And yes, that fruit is ripe, it's rich, but there's just something about that energy that the crispness brings on the finish that makes you want to go in for another glass. Um, and also to that seductive aromas that, you know, is such textbook Pinot and delicious Pinot, makes you want to kind of go back in, but that acid is what makes you want to keep drinking it. And, you know, I, you know, we were talking uh, before getting on, the thing, and Chris was joking how there's a lot of winemakers in Napa who make cab, but they don't want to drink cab. 
And I think a big part of it is because it doesn't have that energy like this, that crispness, that acidity that makes you want to keep drinking. So Travis, this is, I think this is the time. Let's uh, introduce Chris. So Travis, will you please uh, do the honors? Yeah, everyone, we're honored and, and pleased to be joined with Chris Kajani, the winemaker and general manager of Bouchane Winery in Carneros. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. Thanks for having me today, guys. Yeah, great to have you. Um, great wines. Thank you for sharing. Um, so being that you're like the guru, if that's okay to say, of like Carneros, if you could like sum up... What are the best parts of growing grapes in Carneros and the hardest parts of growing grapes in Carneros? I've been working out here since 2004. Um, I actually started uh, with Paul Meyer and uh, working with Lee Hudson Chardonnay uh, before going over to Sainsbury. And I just, I love it out here. We like to say traffic in Carneros means you got stuck behind a tractor. And what you guys were talking about with... Um, the maritime influence, the fog that comes in, just like you would see in San Francisco, the, the kind of very, very cool breeze off the bay. Um, all of that really just allows for superb uh, wine growing conditions for thin skin varieties like Pinot Noir and for a really kind of bright um, and vivacious Chardonnay. Um, I wanna go back for a second and touch on what uh, Keith was saying about how uh, Garrett and Tatiana Copeland purchased Bouchain because uh, Garrett um, is part of the DuPont family and had been in France quite a bit and was a huge, huge uh, lover of Burgundy, as you mentioned. And when he was on a business trip, Mrs. Copeland came out and happened to see this property. And she was standing on the vineyard terraces behind me, looking right across the bay to San Francisco. And at that point in time, the vines were not in great shape. It was a pretty dilapidated building. Um, it, it was not the most attractive spot, I have to tell you. But looking across the bay and watching the fog roll in over Mount Tamil Pius um, and, and sort of feeling those breezes, she thought, oh, this is it. This is that cool climate. This is where we're gonna grow Pinot Noir. Um, and they purchased it in 1981 before Carneros was even an AVA because that happened in 1983. So it's a really cool story and they've put their heart and soul into this place. And I feel really blessed to be able to, um, to make wine here. Um, quick question, because reading through, I mean, Garrett and Tatiana's stories and Tatiana, I mean, Garrett sounds amazing, but Tatiana just sounds like an unbelievable, like, pardon me, badass. Um, he is the coolest. And I'm, just, and I'm just curious, like, are there like dogs everywhere on the property? There are a lot of dogs. Um, they're huge supporters of the Humane Society. They rescued a lot of animals after Hurricane Katrina and got them foster homes and got them adopted. Um, they just, they're, they're incredible to work for, huge proponents uh, of the arts, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's one of the very, very first interview questions is do you have a dog? Um, and honestly, I almost didn't get this job because I had a younger child at the time. And when she asked if I had a dog, I was like, no, because I'm taking care of this little person right now. I like, there's no room for puppies. And she kind of looked at me, I'm like, but we will have one. We will get one. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, as you mentioned, Tatiana Copeland has this ph phenomenal, really interesting background. She's Russian by heritage and her uh, great uncle was, um, the famous, famous composer Rachmaninoff, when she came to look at this property before they actually purchased it, another famous Russian, Andrei Chelnichev, came out here and walked this property with her, you know, and kicked up some of the quartz and obsidian that we see out here because we have these really cool ribbons of volcanic soils. And he said, yes, this is the spot. So um, very excited that uh, we have the Russian backing. <laughs> I didn't know you had that Chilishev uh, connection, but that's that's fantastic. Yeah, she reached out to the one person that she really knew here in the valley way back when, um, and and they walked the whole property together and stood on those terraces together and looked across the bay, and and he gave her the the thumbs up, the seal of approval. Now, kind of like being that they did get the property in '83 and were able to kind of add on acres, plants. How much did you guys dive into like the clonal selections, you know, trying to play that game or, you know, how much of this was, you know, long term, what do we want in the bottle? How do we get the vineyards to help us get there? 
Right, we dug about 15 soil pits when I got here in 2015. Um, and for viewers that have not been in a soil pit, it's like a really bizarre <laughs> grave. It's about three feet wide and about six feet long and about six feet deep. And so it's above my head and you're standing there looking at the stratification of soils, figuring out drainage, how much topsoil, how much clay, is it cobbled? Is there some, some gravelly, um, better drainage in certain sites? And really kind of digging into what this soil looks like. You can also run chemistry on these different um, layers of soil to get a better idea of what rootstock to use or what amendments you might need to make. And so we did all of that in different parts of the vineyard. And we saw that we had this amazing block of Chardonnay. It was planted in 81, but it also, um, as they were digging the soil pits, those last few scoops of soil pit down six feet had almost like a bocce court consistency, this gorgeous gravel. And at that point, that sort of drainage really lends itself to Pinot Noir. So it broke my heart a little to pull out 14 acres of Chardonnay planted in 81. I mean, it was so pretty and we still have about 30 acres left, but uh, that's where we put in a lot of the new clonal selections. And when I say new, um, there's nothing new about Pinot, right? It's one of the oldest varieties uh, on the planet, but these really interesting California heritage clones, uh, the ones that were kind of snuck in from Burgundy, um, Mount Eden and Calera, um, some of these just kind of sexy selections that are really known to be standalone. And by standalone, I mean, you know, if you are able to bottle two, 300 cases, um, just to follow that clone on its own, it can be a real surprise. Some of these uh, really just pop, you know, incredible cardamom, um, things that are really intriguing. And so we like to follow them on their own. And then um, after that selection, we put together sort of uh, all these other fun, um, pieces of it and and get the estate Pinot Noir blend all set. Fantastic. And do you guys play much with non-estate or pretty much almost all the wines are going to be working with your estate fruit? Um, we have worked with G Vineyard um, since their first fruit, which was 1984. And I'm looking at it right now. It's right across the road from us. Um, Dr. G was a nuclear physicist. I'm not making that up. And believe it or not, there was another nuclear guy at the end of the road across from the old Acacia. And uh, that was the St. Clair Vineyard, Jim St. Clair. And Jim St. Clair talked Dr. G into planting. And Dr. G used the same uh, rootstock, same plant material, same spacing, same everything. Used Jim St. Clair's budwood, um, which they call the St. Clair clone. To me, it looks a lot like Martini. Uh, it has a lot of the same character as Martini, but who knows? Uh, and it's on, it's a really interesting vineyard because it's uh, head trained and dry farmed, which you don't see very often for Pinot Noir. So that's really fun. And then we do work um, quite a bit with Hyde Vineyard. Um, Larry Hyde is my virtual boyfriend. He is just the king of Carneros and so gracious and, and just so lovely. Uh, and when we went to replant that 14 acres I was telling you about, I picked Larry's brain and, and bugged him constantly. Uh, so we do a little bit of their Chardonnay, a little Syrah, and a little Merlot, as you mentioned. His side of Carneros is very slightly warmer, and the Merlot is really lovely. Um, and then, because we are just interested in making 20 different wines, um, we buy a little bit of Riesling and a little bit of Pinot Blanc, just to kind of have one acre of each and mix it up a little bit for our wine club. Very cool. And then everything else is a steak. There's 104 acres here with about 88 acres planted. And uh, it's, it's about 50-50 Pinot Chardonnay. And then when we did the, the 14 acre replant, we did add in some of our own Riesling, a tiny bit of Syrah that came from, uh, the Budwood came from the Hyde Vineyard um, and a tiny bit of uh, Gewurztraminer, just, just because. Great. And I have a question. So many of us on the on the sommelier and restaurant side tend to think of Carneros as sort of one thing, but you all make a point of indicating that you're working with a variety of different micro uh, microclimates across Carneros. Could you talk a little bit about how uh, the Appalachian is different, either from east to west or else along uh, uh, different areas where the soils may vary? Or what's the what's the diversity we're dealing with here? Sure. Um 
I've worked with both sides of Carneros. We used to work with a lot of San Giacomo fruit when I was with Saintsbury, and the fog tends to pull back slightly earlier on the Sonoma side. The Napa River really sucks that fog in. Um, and as you guys uh, may know, having been here in the summertime, it'll go all the way up into St. Helena some days. Um, and it will literally look like a river of fog on top of the river. It's amazing. Um, and it will do that also up the Petaluma River, but but seemingly it, it pulls back a little bit uh, a little bit sooner. I think with the Petaluma Gap and and the cool breezes that go through there, um, it doesn't have that same pull as uh, the heat up Valley in Napa and that heat from Calistoga and St. Helena that really pull that fog in deep. Um, so other sort of areas of Carneros. Um, Mount Veter basically is on our northern side, and Mount Veter's a you know an old volcano, and so depending on where you are, there are these crazy ribbons of uh, of uh, quartz and of onyx and uh, onyx and obsidian, um, really really beautiful um, beautiful uh, soil variation. There's definitely some deep clay, which can be fantastic for Chardonnay here, holds water really well, and Chardonnay tends to need uh, a bit more of that and doesn't require the same drainage as Pinot Noir. And there's warmer areas. So we're very close to the water, um, but as I mentioned before, if you go across Highway 12 and you're headed up Old Sonoma Road, um, that's where Saintsbury's Old Ranch was, that's where Hyde is. And if you wanna do something with a little bit uh, um, of a warmer variety, you can. So Merlot over there does really well. And in fact, I think Larry Hyde even has a bit of Cabernet. And down here on the water, um, we're gonna hold a little bit more acid. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit more fog and a little bit more wind right on the water. Um, and depending on, on sort of the aspect of the vine, um, we will plant different things based on the amount of sunshine it's gonna get and, and, and based on the amount of drainage and soil characteristics, as I mentioned, the soil pits. So there's there's a lot of microclimate here to play with. It's been a lot of fun. Very cool. And then do you have as big a dernal shift as up valley or is it a little bit more low and slow, longer growing season or shorter growing season? Well, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> the the trick to winemaking or, or grape growing really um, is you're at the the mercy of mother nature you do the exact same thing every year completely differently depending on if it's hot or dry wet or cold early or late season um, it's really interesting and and always challenging and and fun to be honest so there's a huge shift in temperature just daytime temperature if we're 80 and calistoga is 110 that's 30 degrees but we do see the diurnal shift also. Um, it was interesting because one day last November, I want to say, um, we had a high of about 75 here and it plummeted into the 20s at night. So there's that's not the normal shift, but you will see these crazy shifts. Um, the bay tends to uh, kind of mediate any real, real um, frost issues. We get a little frost here, but the, the breezes off the bay and, and the sort of temperature regulation off the bay is very helpful. So we don't see quite as much frost. And then I guess just kind of, if you could sum up your philosophy on how, how do you go about crafting your wines? I mean, are you, you know, do you look to the French model? Do you look to the California model? Or, you know, what, what's your style? How would you sum it up? I would say we certainly honor the French model, which is spend all your time in the vineyard. So if you're bringing in amazing grapes, there's a whole lot less that you would have to do in the winery itself. And that's definitely the plan. We have a lot of old vine here. Um, the vines planted in, in the Chardonnay planted in 1981, as I mentioned, and most of the Pinot um, outside of this 14 acre replant, most of the Pinot was planted in, in 93 to 96. So it's older vine. We work with an all female vineyard crew throughout the growing season because um, they're super detailed. Um, and these ladies I've worked with since I was at Saintsbury. So I've worked with them for many, many years. And if we do a panel of 20 vines and, and say, hey, we'd like it shoot position like this. We'd like it leafed like that. Uh, if we're gonna fruit thin, can we, can we kind of mirror this across the vineyard? And then we come in you know, the next day and the next day and everything's just picture perfect. It's kind of amazing. 
So we definitely honor the French model and spend so much time in the vineyard. In fact, most days I'm not wearing a dress. I look like someone threw a trash can on me because between uh, doing trials on, on different um, panels of grapes and, and certainly during harvest, um, it's a pretty messy position. Uh, but it's great to, to go out and, and watch the full cycle. You're watching bud break, you're watching bloom, you're watching verasion and tasting grapes before you've even had your coffee in the morning. I'm staring at my coffee now. Um, <laughs> so uh, all of that has been incredibly rewarding. And I think it just makes a better wine when that time and that effort and that, that uh, energy is, is put into the vineyard. We have also redone uh, the winery itself things that are not very sexy, like trench drains and flooring and glycol systems and punch down devices and, and stuff that's not sexy, but is really important because uh, you want your winery to be clean. You want to make sure that all the, the grapes that you've worked so hard during the year um, to, to instill the best quality you can come into a winery that um, is not going to allow for any spoilage. And so we've spent a lot of time not only in the vineyard, but upgrading the winery and, and some of those systems. Uh, so now it's uh, now we're kind of on cruise control. It's a lot of fun. We'll segue to that, and we can we can kind of keep it geeky while we're uh, while we started that direction. So Chardonnay begins coming into the winery. Um, is there anything in particular you're you're doing to uh, to craft this style of Chardonnay? Uh, any special presses? Um, how about malolactic fermentation? Your your oak sort of philosophy? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, um, we're huge fans of Chardonnay here um, in kind of that uh, Burgundian mindset, right? Chardonnay is just king. And so in addition to kind of babying the vines throughout the season and doing a pretty low crop um, on these vines planted in, in 81 and 84, we're harvesting at night. Everything's on the crush pad by six o'clock in the morning. Fruit's nice and cold. It goes into a Euro press, uh, three hour press cycle. And one of the fun things we do is we're settling that juice overnight. And as we, we barrel that juice down, because it is barrel fermented, uh, when you get to the bottom of the tank and you have leaves that have settled, we just take huge handfuls of those leaves and you just get your face in it and you smell it and you taste it. And if it's, you know, peachy and white flower and it smells delicious, we just start taking huge um, pitchers and sticking that straight into the barrel. And that additional leaves contact, uh, my feeling is when you're when you're doing a wine that's part malolactic and you're not going all the way through and so you're maintaining some of that malic acid and, and it gives you some of that tension in the wine if you can round that slightly with some additional leaves the wines just turn out so beautifully um we actually learned that technique from ted lemon at literai so i stole that from ted um but we love the way that the the body of the wine comes together with that additional lease contact and then I think, as Keith had mentioned, um, it's about 15 or so percent of new oak, and it's all French oak. Um, so that little bit of oak adds a spice and adds a layer, but we're not crushing the, the freshness of the fruit and that sort of vitality of the fruit with, um, with large percentages of oak, just enough to add a little layer to it. Great. And then how about for Pinot Noir? So when Pinot Noir comes in, um, any... Uh whole cluster or partial whole cluster? What's your philosophy there? Yeah, so Pinot Noir, depending on season, uh, we will definitely add whole cluster. We have some seasons that are late um, where the rachis, which actually connects the cluster to the shoot itself, will be really green. And in those cases, we don't tend to do a lot of whole cluster. I like a, a rachis that is really brown and, and it adds like, somebody was mentioning cola nut, like it adds this crazy spicy component, almost cola and definitely some cinnamon. Um, and that's not from oak. That's like from that whole cluster that's really fun and, and adds this great, great layer to the wine. Um, so we will definitely do that in seasons where we get good lignification and that, that rachis itself is like brown and, and uh, ready for whole cluster. We also do a lot of open top fermentations. We have three, four, five, five and a half, six ton open tops in addition to some, some closed top tanks. And those open tops, um, it almost feels like you get a real um, kind of intimate relationship with your grapes. You're standing over them on a daily basis. You're smelling that cap. Um, 
it, you feel a little more connected to it for me anyway than you will with a clothes top where you're just kind of using a sprinkler and you can't really see what's happening and you can't get your face in there quite as much. Um, so we love working with those open tops and we tend to be pretty hands off. So height of fermentation, we're punching down maybe twice a day. We're kind of trying to leave this wine alone. We don't want to extract a lot of tannin. We want it to be, you know, really vivacious and, and, and have some tension to it, but not be so tannic that it's not enjoyable younger. Um, and with all the great food that you guys were talking about earlier. And the one other thing I'll mention is there's, there's about 12 or 13 different clones in this estate Pinot Noir. And I think that mix of Pinot clones um, can be really fun because the Pomard clone is all mocha and plum and the Swan clone is super high toned and, and roses and uh, like a bowl of raspberries. And when you put all these things together, um, I think it just knits and gives you these layers that, that uh, as you guys were mentioning, just make you want to take another sip with that pretty acidity. First off, I mean, once again, thank you. The wines are delicious and can't wait to come oh, out and hang, hang out there and, and taste with you. Do at it. The I'll throw you in a vineyard track and we'll go look at the fog. <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, the last time ripping through vineyards was years ago with Jeff Short back when he was at Buena Vista. And I, I, I remember the beginning of that day, but not the end of that day, which is kind of a typical Jeff day. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I, I remember reading somewhere that one of your favorite things is and if people have not tried this it is actually one of the greatest things on the planet and that is popcorn and champagne and i was just wondering yeah. like what's your what's your what's your go-to champagne like what's your like when you you know get through a harvest in a rough like fire year like 2020 you're like okay right. i got the popcorn ready i'm ready to pop the champagne what's the champagne right um I really love that Agripar. Um, and it doesn't really matter which bottling it is as far as I'm concerned. I just love um, the tension to the, the champagne and that kind of like just beautiful bracing palette. Um, and then when you put it with popcorn and maybe even like sprinkle some dill on the popcorn with your butter, it's, it's magic. It's magic. You have to try it. Yeah, it's, it is one of the, it's like, I wish we could, like, when we're teaching food and wine pairing, it's like, this is what we're talking about now. <laughs> um, I do want to let you guys know that um, this whole uh, virtual setup is so exciting for me because we've done a ton of virtual tastings with our customers. It was really lonely here as we closed in March, <laughs> and we didn't have all our, our club members and our our. Um, our fans stopping by, we're still closed at this point. And so to, to virtually connect with you and to do virtual tastings with other folks, it, it's so great to bring the Napa Valley to everybody. Um, and I really appreciate going through, through wines with you guys out in New York. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully looking forward to non-virtual tastings in the future. So yes. Cheers. Definitely. Cheers, everyone.